And Tom, like, how are you, Jim? The vet center will be providing free dog tags to all veterans. So after the uh, program is over, Tom will be there, and if you wish to have a free dog tag, please see Tom. The other thing is, we're currently passing the helmet, and anything that goes into the helmet helps to defray the cost of the museum operations. So we appreciate all that you do in giving to that to, the, to us at the museum. So today's program is about the AC-130 gunship, and uh, Paul is going to make an announcement. Really good. I like it. 
says, why were you over there with us? I said, well, Hank, I really appreciate that, but my high school gym class teacher wouldn't let me out of school to go fly missions on a trail. So I was not there. He just, by reading it, I would have never known that. So I took that as a, as a compliment. And so it was my drive to capture this unique history that we have in the AC-130. And my question to everyone here is, has anybody ever heard of an AC-130 before by show of hands? Well, that's great. Uh, AC-130, TAC C-130. Sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? Why did we do all this? Well, see if I can figure out the technology here. All right, there's a lineage, and I'm going to briefly cover these things. And please feel free if you feel that you want to ask a question anytime, stop me. I want this to be as informal and informative as I can be. Uh, but I will take questions at the end as well. And I will be available afterwards to answer any specific questions. The AC-130 came out of the Puff the Magic Dragon the AC-47 program, which started in 64. The AC-130s started in 67 and then all the way through uh, what we're going to cover today is the period of the Vietnam War. So you can see up here, that's the lineage. We just built 30 brand new AC-130Js. I remember when I started in AC-130s back in 1978, they said, don't plan on staying here long because the gunship is going to be retired and you'll never see them again. Here it is. 2024, and we're, we just built 20 or 30 brand new ones. So apparently, there is a real need for them. All right. Now, what kind of crazy people would take and put guns and sensors on a cargo airplane? What would be the need for that? We had plenty of fighters, we had bombers, we had all of these things that were real attack airplanes. Why did we put guns on a cargo airplane? This includes the AC-119s, the AC-130, and the, of course, uh, the grand baby of them all, the AC-47. And it comes right down to, you can see up there, there were some problems, especially in Vietnam, especially on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is where the AC-130 comes in. So how many people here are aware, again by a show of hands, was the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Vietnam? See, you guys are an educated crowd. A lot of Vietnam veterans, I'm sure of that. Now, it was in Laos and Cambodia. AC-130s were de developed, essentially, to interdict truck traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to keep all supplies coming in out of the north from going down into the south. So AC-130s, they were uh, originally invented also the AC 47s for uh, long duration over target because the North Vietnamese found that hey, we move at night, we can get in there, we can hit hard, we can do these big human wave attacks, and there really is, they can send in a fighter, they can send in a bomber, but they have limited duration, and they got large ordnance. So that was ne uh, not necessarily a good thing. Limited night capable aircraft then, and what we have right now is pretty amazing, but back then, very limited night capability. Uh, fighters and bombers here talk about that. Plus, if you're going to be there for an entire period of darkness or as close as you can get, you should have enough weapons on board to be able to use for the duration of that mission. So that's how it comes down to, well, we can do a lot of things with fighters, we can do a lot of things with bombers, but we can't do all these things. With the gunship, it was the right effect at the right place at the right time. So really, the only way you could do that, all these things together, is to arm a cargo airplane, and that's how that came out. All right. The other thing about station keeping is the gunship concept, and this applies to all of that I'm talking about, it's all math. Sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? But this is kind of a fun math. You're flying in a circular orbit, always to the left, because the pilot sat on the left side of the airplane. The pilot fired the guns on the earliest AC-130s, and the, all the uh, gunships essentially up until that point. So, fly a circular orbit, 
You stay on target for as long as you need to. You fire on the target for as long as you need to. Uh, you also need a lot of ammunition, what we call deep magazine. So deep magazine is, uh, well, for example, an AC-47, 23,000 rounds was a typical ammo load, 762. The AC-130 was 23,000 when it first started out, 762. And also uh, 6,000 rounds, 20 millimeter. Here's an example of uh, kind of a crude line drawing. The first AC-130 had four 7.62 miniguns that fired at a rate of 3,000 and 6,000 rounds per minute rate. Had uh, four 20 millimeter guns that had 1,500 rounds behind each gun, so 6,000 rounds. A lot of, and here's uh, brought these display samples, 20 millimeter for all those that work fighters, uh, should be very familiar to you. Standard M61 Gatling gun adapted for use on the AC-130. Had 4 and 4, had a very early IR sensor, infrared sensor, that would pick up uh, heat signatures and differential between, and had a, the very first one was just amazing. And I think I have a picture of it in the next slide. Net observation device where they actually took a night, night scope, um, and they call it a night observation device, and had a guy sit in a door, it was an officer, that was tracking and looking for targets in that open door. Very crude. You gotta remember, the very first gunship, the uh, AC-130, started out in 1 April of 1967. They picked up the airplane at Edwards, flew it up to Ohio for mods. By September, they were in Vietnam for combat trials. That's pretty quick. That's way quicker than we could do anything nowadays. So it was very crude, as you might well imagine. If it works, give me 80%. I can work with 80%. That's where they, where that mindset came from. They also had a uh, illuminator that came out the back, 40 kilowatt spotlight, which they didn't like to use a lot of the trail because, you know, it kind of highlighted your position. So, all right. Now, the crew. Now, I have to say this, it's not just the crew, you know, it's up here, we had a lot of people supporting the AC-130s, maintainers, uh, gun, what we call gun plumbers, we've got uh, uh, avionics specialists, and all these systems were basically cobbled together so quickly that there was no standardized procedure for pretty much any of it. These guys, especially the maintainers, had to figure stuff out as they went, because these things were one-off experimental items. There was no technical data. It's like, okay, go out there and figure it out. That's typically what it was. So it was very, very, very challenging. As far as the crew goes, we had a pilot, who's also the aircraft commander. Uh, original ones had combat photographers. They didn't have the ability to video record what we call bomber damage assessment. So they actually put Air Force photographers on the airplane to shoot 35 millimeter or 60 millimeter motion picture film of the trucks being attacked at night with high ASA film. Kind of uh, unique. And you can see uh, the gunners, which I was one. The gunners on the AC-130 are the manual labor. You're loading the guns, you're maintaining the guns, you're doing everything but firing the guns, which sounds kind of weird, but it's all a crew airplane. Everybody on the crew has to do their job in order to make it successful. So, very crew-centric, as you might well imagine, uh, when you got work on the crews that were 12 to 14 people on a crew, you had different comm systems for each one, because otherwise it would just be like, you know, remember the old show, Mama's Family, where they argue with them all the time? That's what it sounded like. So. So uh, calm was very important, but I can tell you in my time in the gunships, when you flew with a crew and you knew them well enough that you didn't have to say a whole lot. You could hear things going on and say, okay, we're getting ready to do this, I'm gonna do this, and get ready. And all you had to do was confirm by the time. Guns are armed, guns are armed. Now, away you go. So it's very, very crew-centric. Uh, down there, you'll see on the on your left or on your right lower, that's the IR sensor. It's a very, very early Texas Instruments sensor that worked okay, 
but not really great, but it was very cutting edge at the time that you could differ differentiate between, like, say, uh, a truck and uh, some other lar large object, but really they had a problem with elephants at one time. Elephants look like trucks, but they're not. And, and that's the problem. They fired on these elephants, which were also used for smuggling things down the trail. Well, they found out that trucks don't do stuff that elephants do once you open fire on them. So one of those things, lessons learned. And you can see right down here, this gentleman right here, that's uh, Bill Newell. He was one of our earliest nod operators sitting in that open door up in front of that C-130, tracking and finding targets at night. Now, AC-130 always, especially in the early days, operated at night. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier about that's when the north, the PAVN started moving down south. They always moved at night and used the cover of darkness. Uh, the few times that they did try moving in the daytime, and I'm talking 68 through 73 now, uh, they, they kept on moving at, at daytime. They figured out sometimes they'd move at daytime right before the sun came up because they knew that the gunships wouldn't be there and the fighters wouldn't be there yet. So there was kind of like a, a cat and mouse game that they played all the time. Our crews did the same thing, cat and mouse. Well, they were, uh, the AC-130s were stationed in Ubon, Thailand, and there you can see a representative of one of the crews, and that is uh, aircraft 630, actually, Morris Callis. It's under the name Azrael Angel of Death. It's in the Air Force Museum as it sits right now on the indoor displays. The terrain of Laos was the biggest challenge of them all. It was used to the advantage of both sides, our side and theirs. Uh, our side used the terrain to mask and go through, but then again, it was difficult. You see, these are actual photographs of the terrain of Laos. The lower photograph is actually a gunship imagery photograph of trucks moving down the trail. So, primary target was the uh, Zill trucks. Uh, they also had a bunch of other things that they chased after. It wasn't just trucks, but uh, there was uh, one in particular you can see on your lower left or lower right, what they call SO trucks, where they would bring fuel down. And some of the more exciting parts of reading the history was our crews had even developed a tactic to where they would track the truck into these SO trucks, as they call them, until they're going up a steep embankment and terrain, and then they'd shoot the truck to bust open the fuel tanks so the fuel would run down the hill and caught, catch all the other trucks in line back on fire. But the typical tactic that they used was uh, our guys was to shoot the lead truck first, then shoot the trail truck, and then just spend a couple hours just picking on them in between. That was, uh, there was no place for them to go. The North Vietnamese drivers, uh, Group 559 is what they were called, they had figured this stuff out real early on that if they stay in their trucks, they're going to die. So what they did was the minute the gunship would come over, They'd open fire on the, on the hit the trail of the lead truck. They'd all stop, and they would bail out, and they had places to go in the jungle. And how they operated, which we were talking about earlier, very interesting to me that the Group 559 had such a good uh, tactic. They called, they broke up the trail. It's not like one truck started up at the Mugia Pass, just drove all the way down into Cambodia and South Vietnam. They typically had 10 to 15 kilometer runs, which they called, uh, the it's way stops are called bin trams, which was like a, a camouflage base camp, if you will, but smaller. And so these trucks would be at these bin trams that were hidden, and each night they would move that 10 or 15 kilometers to the next one, and then return like a shuttle process, almost like uh, like mail delivery or Federal Express does right now. So it's a sequence of events. So the advantage they got out of that is when the when they uh, 
started to move down the trails. The drivers knew every turn, every hook. They knew where every stump was. They knew where they had their foxholes, essentially, in the trail. So the gunship opened fire on them. They would ban get off their trucks, and off they would go. Which I'm not going to go into great detail on. There's a great story in book one about uh, how the general, General Young, who ran the trail, was so disturbed with his drivers bailing out of his trucks that he actually threatened them and called them cowards. And they said to the general, they said, you don't understand, sir, this airplane doesn't need flares, it doesn't need anything, it can track you with electronic sensors, it's an electric bird. It, you're not going to get away from it. He says, there is no such airplane. I will show you. So the very next night, he mounted up on a 50-truck convoy. Our, our records say 30-truck convoy, and so you know I'm going with this. It says 50-truck convoy in the North Vietnamese records that I have, and it says, I'll show you. He gets up on that convoy, they drive down there, and lo and behold, about halfway through their journey to the other Ben Tran, gunship find them. And I actually, that crew got crew the quarter because they shot every one of those trucks. And nobody in the convoy wanted to bail off the truck because the general was on the lead truck. And so they all stuck with it, and a few of them, uh, they didn't all die, but they all got damaged. So the very next day, the general comes back and says, okay, I, I was wrong. I blamed you people. We got to do something about this airplane. And that's what they did. It was always a constant fight. There were the threats. When I talk about constant fight, it started out with 37 millimeter AAA first, and aircraft artillery, 37 millimeter in 68, 69. That was the common. It kept on increasing the number of guns in the trail as time went on because the gunship was taking a heavy toll. By, by 1970, they had already scored over 4,000 truck kills. Just that small contention of, of uh, seven AC-130s at that time. So they were making pretty good progress. They brought in, in, uh, in 71, they started bringing in 57 millimeter guns, which would go through the, uh, go through the altitude that any gunship was flying at back then. And then eventually SA-2 and SA-7 in 1972, and we did lose two airplanes, which I'll detail later on to those systems. So, we're talking about tactical challenges. Uh, there's some examples of uh, gunfire, 37 millimeter, both these are 37 millimeter, uh, that have hit the C-130. It's not a fighter, it's a cargo airplane, so it's robust, but it's not like robust like you would imagine. So they took quite a lot of damage. First one we lost was in uh, 69, 37 millimeter. Lost an hydraulic system and a lot of crash on the runway of, uh, of Uma return. <laughs> that one on the lower right is actually aircraft 129 that's on display at the Air Force Monitor Museum at Aikman Air Force Base, where I'm, where I'm from. And uh, that was also <coughs> one of the, the first production C 130 cargo airplane. On, the, on your left, you'll see that globe or that fire that. Uh, and you'll see these two smaller dots. That was given to me by Bill Patterson, one of our IOs, the illuminator operator, which I forgot to mention, I'm sorry. He's the one that hung over the edge of the open ramp, looking out, scanning for AAA. Everything was tracers back then. So they would look and they would see the tracers, almost like a World War II movie, where if the tracer looks like it's stationary, that means it's coming right at you. They would call a break for the pilot, would then maneuver the airplane out of the orbit to break away from the tracer. Uh, the, some of the missions, Force 71, they would get over 1,100 rounds of 37 millimeter fired at it in a four hour mission and not get hit. So they got pretty good at dodging the AAA. They actually got a little bit, a bit cocky at one time. And towards 72, they took, uh, uh, there was a, a message intercepted by, sent out by the North Vietnamese and our intelligence people intercepted the message. And the message said, we will reward any gun crew with fresh meat, fresh food, 
and for anybody that can shoot down one of these gunships, which they had a name for the gunship, they call it the Old Lady. Uh, I don't know, I guess that's supposed to be their, their negative. But they didn't like the gunship, I can tell you that. So our guys found out about this, and one of the gunners went downtown in Thailand and bought a little piglet about this big. And they call it Operation Pave Pig. They came back with the piglet and took a flare box and hooked a couple parachutes to the flare box and they put a note on the inside and made a cage out of it essentially. And a note on the inside written in Vietnamese and uh, in French saying, here's your reward for substandard marksmanship. <laughs> and so they flew over the trail. And I know this happened. This sounds like folklore, but it actually did happen. I've got pictures of it and I got witnesses. They flew over the trail and they said the first gun site that opened up, they pushed the piglet out on the parachute. They had flares on there and a, and a specter lighter inside of the carton of cigarettes. So, kind of a blunt, dark humor, I guess you could say. All right. Now, towards 1970 and late 69, early 70, airplanes were getting shot up a whole lot. And uh, we had, at that time, lost the second one in April of 1970. They were flying at 7,500 feet. That's as high as they could get with the 20 millimeters to be effective. So they said, we need to get higher. So went up here, Crane, Indiana, got uh, two 40 millimeter guns that belonged to the Navy and said, let's bolt these things on and see if they work. And this is a 40 millimeter round right here, you can see. World War II, as a matter of fact, another Indiana uh, company, Tokheim Pump Company up at Fort Wayne, built millions of 40 millimeter AP shot uh, back during World War II. And I personally have shot thousands of them because we were still shooting them up until about five years ago on an over. 40 millimeter, now they had capabilities to hit the trucks at 10,000 feet, that was their standard altitude. And that was, you see the guns are still even got the gray paint on them there on the left. Came straight out of the crane and Navy Yard. Eventually, all the airplanes were modified with the 40 millimeter gun, which was really effective. Uh, the one mission I talked about with, with General Young, well guess what? 40 millimeters did most of that. That was the crew of the month at that time. And there you can see the crews. By 1971, the first AC-130E was delivered. By that time, the, the whole complement of gunships was right around 18. That's it, total. That's, but they were still racking up the majority of truck kills. The crew also grew from being original nine. Now it was, it was 13, and sometimes 14 people on a crew. Uh, and then if you added more auxiliary crew members, you, you get a big crew after a while. So it's a very crew intensive airplane. 1972, now, remember I was talking about getting higher and getting higher and getting higher. The higher you get, the more your circular error probable occurs and you put out more shots in order to get hit. So the Air Force, AFRL, or excuse me, um, ASD, said, well, how big can we go? So they had come up with a concept for a 75 millimeter gun, which is the old B-25 gun, and, but they weren't really that available, and there was some problems with that, but something that was really available, and something that was in wide circulation, was the M-102 howitzer in the U.S. Army. It was relatively new at that point, so they said, you know what? <laughs> This is what I did. It's 40, 42 pound round, 32 and a half pound projectile. And once that was put on the airplane, in 1972, the trials, they sent it over to Vietnam, and uh, or to Ubon to work the trails. It was like magic. It was 15 times more fragments and blast than the 40 millimeter, way out in the 20 millimeter, now it's like they could fire that thing up to 18,000 feet. We couldn't get that high, but the highest we could get is banging on about 10 or 12. 
And then we didn't have supplemental oxygen, so we couldn't really go up and stay there. But the answer, uh, North Vietnamese answer was, let's go with 57 millimeter now. Let's go with SA2s. And there you can see that as actually the very first 105 gun installed on that aircraft. That aircraft was shot down, uh, and Jake Mercer, the one in the background, was actually one of our KAAs on that uh, 1972. That was uh, March uh, 30th, or 29th, excuse me. So there you can see the pictures of 574, Ping Aegis. That's the 105 mod. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting to see just how far we would go. 1972, it got even tougher. Because now with all these extra air defenses they were putting out, 57 millimeter guns with uh, the uh, SA-2 missile, which is very, uh, very intriguing how I found out about how they ambushed a gunship, Spectre 13 with, uh, with an SA-2. SA-2 is not as much bigger than that airplane back there. And they actually managed to bring that 23 miles across the river or across the border into Laos and ambush an AC-130 in an area they never thought the SA-2 would be viable in. The other one uh, is Ken Felty's airplane. On the, on the right side there, you see that hole that was an SA-7 that hit him. That was a daylight, one of the rare daylight missions in 1972 during the Eastern Offensive. And they were tracking, the sensor operator was tracking with the covert mode illuminator. And that was just basically a lens. We still put out a heat source, but you couldn't really see it. Well, they had the light on in the daytime, even though they didn't need it. And they were trying to prove that these SA-7s, manned portable air defense missile, the small ones, they were trying to prove that they were actually in theater because Intel would believe that they were actually there. So the IR sensor operator is tracking and they launched about five of them at the same time, and he's tracking it. And he's tracking the missile, not knowing that he is actually putting the heat source right there on the missile. The missile tracked right up to the airplane, and that's where it hit. The actual light is like right up above there. So it was, uh, didn't lose the airplane. The airplane came back uh, very, very carefully. And that was uh, Ken Felty, the IO, which I just talked to him last week. He got 37, I think, fragment hits from that, but he wound up surviving. And that is also his flight suit with all the hit marks and everything are in the Air Force Museum up at, at Dayton, Ohio. So that uh, was a pretty hairy episode for them. And finally, uh, through all of that, September of the Vietnam ceasefire occurred early in 73, then the, the Cambodian ceasefire, excuse me, the uh, Laotian ceasefire, and then finally the Cambodian ceasefire. The last mission flown in Vietnam for AC-130s was here in September of 73. So, I will ran through that pretty quick, uh, but I would like to open it up for questions. There's a lot of folklore out there about the AC-130, and uh, I'm not gonna claim that I know it all, but I know so. Anybody got any questions? Sir? about a flying in a circle the, on target. I witnessed one doing a sweeping motion. You could see the solid red line of pressure coming down the wiggle as it's coming down in the hum. And the same was I'll put him in the hum tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he was sweeping the grid square at the time. Yeah, did, did everybody hear what he said? Basically he said that uh, you you want to repeat it with the mic or yeah. okay. It, uh, as that gunship came over, flying in a circle, it would wiggle its way up and down, and the solid red line, and it gun shot so fast it looked like a ray gun. It did not wrap that, but it hung, and you could see the line swapping like this. That he was sweeping the grid square. I don't know what he was shooting at, but I would assume there might be truth in something like that if he was shooting that way. Yes, sir, and that was a, that was a standard tactic for the AC-47 that they would cover a wider area. The gun itself was uh, firing at 6,000 rounds per minute rate, so yeah, I'm with you there. It sounds more like a growl than a, than a gun. And the typical uh, attack with an AC-47 was the 
the helix itself, depending on which model, but I'm talking about the later model, would hold 2,000 rounds. They fired two guns simultaneously in modes that include what you're saying. They keep the third gun cold while the other two were firing, so that then, as soon as those two guns were what we call Winchester, they would be depleted of their ammunition. When as soon as those two guns would run dry, the gunners would go to reload them, and they'd switch to the third gun and fire that one while the other two were being reloaded. So. You can see if you got a, a, a helical feed system that holds 2,000 rounds, you got 23,000 rounds on board, you're going to be doing a lot of reloading. And that's what they did. The guns also was kind of a, like a built-in safeguard from overfiring the gun and actually cooking the barrels now, which you don't really melt the barrels, but they get so hot that they can't stand the hoop tension strength anymore and it'll actually blow a hole off the side which happened to us on the AC-130 all the time. Usually, somebody overfired a gun prior, a prior mission, and it cooled off uh, quickly in the, in the airflow. The next time you go up there to fire about uh, two, three rounds in, or two, three bursts into it, and it blows out the side of the barrel. Makes one heck of a racket. What was the sighting system on that? On the AC-130, uh, well, on all the early gunships, it was called a head-up display. And it was a reflex gun sight. The earlier AC-47s, they, they cobbled it from another aircraft on an A-1, if I remember right, and mounted it in the window. And there was also, and you hear these tales about grease pencil marks. It's true. They did. Because sometimes you couldn't mess around with sighting in this fight. Because you're different altitudes, different air density, different everything. So it's like the quickest way was put out a burst, note where you're at, mark that on your, your glass plate of the HUD, and that's your new aiming offset. So that making things work is, uh, is what you need to do sometime. Sir? Well, third ground observers guide you C-130s, or how did they find their target? How did the C-130, were the ground observers communicating with them, or how did they zero in? Well, there's two, two ways of addressing that. One is, in the earlier days, there were trail watchers, that we saw it, trail watchers, that would bring them in, but typically did not get calls for fire from the trail watchers. But they would radio back where the trucks were, the guns would fire. But all the AC-130s, and, uh, and I'm talking about AC-130s now, they all were forward air control qualified pilots. So they were what we call self-facking forward air control pilots. So in the Laos, we weren't supposed to be there to begin with. So really, there was, it was all considered hostile territory. So they would find the trucks, they'd ID the trucks, and they'd fire on the trucks without anybody overhead. Now, sometimes, especially during the daytime missions, you would work for a forward air controller, but rarely in Laos or Cambodia. Sometimes in Cambodia in the later years, in 73, uh, they fired a lot on targets with Cambodian uh, facts, or what they call them, forward air ground observers. So yes, so I guess the question is, depends on when and what time frame, but on the trail in Laos, not really. Uh, in Cambodia, yes. In Vietnam, yes, absolutely, almost every time. Because there were missions flown in Vietnam by the AC-130 that were troops in contact, as you say. Sir? Was the 20 millimeter, was that a Vulcan cannon? Yes, a uh, Vulcan. Okay. Yeah. M61, same one that was used in almost every one of the fighters at the time, and I, it still is used in a lot of fighters. And the only difference was if we fired a linked ammunition belt, whereas the fighters had a, a helical uh, drive system, or a helical feed system, linkless feed. So, and that's why they could fire up to 6,000 rounds per minute rate. We did, we fired at 2,500 rounds per minute rate, because we're looking for a different effect you're putting out, like say, the, the 20 millimeter gun was typically, with our fire control and our accuracy, was a six mil radian gun. 
So six mils to one unit in a thousand. So if you're at 6,000 feet, you got a 60 foot circle. So uh, from other radial. So standard stuff. You know, that's a big thing is almost all, everything in all the variants of the gunships I'm talking about here were adaptations from something else. You got the 105 from the Army, you got the 40s from the Navy, and then from the Army, because the production ones were actually Army guns, because Army had 40 millimeter guns too. The 762 was uh, the minigun, was still in production under the M134 M134 right now, but it was new at that time. Uh, it just came out in 65, if I remember right. Yeah, so it was uh, very much ad hoc. And remember when, like I said earlier, when they first built the gunship, nobody expected it to be around all that long. We need it for this specific task, we'll build it. It's not pretty, it's ugly, it's a cargo airplane. It'll do what we need it to do. And nobody ever expected that Bill Walter would be up here talking about gunships 55 years later. Including me. Okay. Sir. On the 105 uh, rounds, what were your fusing and your charges that you used? Okay. We uh, we used uh, a M557 fuse. I take it you're an RD guy. Awesome. Uh, 557 and 557 fuse was our standard. Uh, we did use later on M732 and M732A2, but that was post Vietnam. The only fuse we used in uh, Vietnam time frame was the 557 and full up charge seven canisters. And the reason being, and I asked Preston Parker, who was one of the original engineers, I said, we don't need that much power because a charge seven is the maximum charge, you know, in 102 tube or 137 tube. Why do we need that? It's just too much recoil because every time you fired that gun, I'm standing right next to it, and it doesn't look that dramatic, but it's 2,000 pounds of mass going 47 inches into the airplane and then recoiling back. You don't really notice that much except for movement, but we did some instrumentation of the airplane. It says every time you fire that gun, it side slips the airplane 12 to 13 feet. So just kick it out. And they come back in again because it's an airplane. But uh, we did some experiments later on with Charge 5. Charge 5 really worked better for us, but uh, Charge 7 was the standard. And we did we did play around with in the 80s a bunch of different RD rounds, the M84 rounds, the uh, BEs, and all everything else. But pretty much uh, HE and Willie P was our standard back then. Did they ever go to a 30 millimeter Gatling gun? Uh, we did go with a 30 millimeter, and that was one of my projects when I was still doing it, uh, but it, not a Gatling gun. We did do some studies in, uh, in this, I'll see if I can remember the year, uh, it, was, uh, it was the late 80s. We did a study with Lockheed, uh, and we did a study with uh, another company that wanted to put the 30 millimeter GAU-8 from the A-10 on the AC-130. And that came up periodically, time to time. It, it really didn't do what we needed to do because the, 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 the CEP was just very huge and there was a lot of mass and it was a hydraulically driven gun. So basically, it didn't work out, but the 30 millimeter round we liked. So we did adapt the Mark 44 Navy gun, which is managed right up at Crane. As a matter of fact, somebody in this room might work on those. And up at Crane, they're, uh, well, we call it the GAL 23, but it's the Mark 44 30 millimeter chain gun. It fires that same uh, 30 by uh, 173 round that the A-10 does. The, uh, uh, the 105 round is a separate uh, round where you had to drop it into the case. Did they crimp them before they put them on, on, on the uh, uh, airship? Or it was just one solid round? Or did they have to do that uh, while in flight? Now, we, uh, I have fired on test semi-fixed ammunition where we actually had to assemble them on the airplane, but it's really not advisable. Uh, you drop the powder bags out, you do all kinds of things. 
No, typically we fired M14 brass canisters, which were crimped at the factory with a pull force of about 750 pounds plus or minus 50. So we couldn't pull them apart. You pull them out of the rack, and they were just loose enough to where they would float and center up in the chamber, but not so tight that uh, that they would jam up the gun. So it was, it was all fixed ammunition is what we what we fired. I got one more question. Did they have air burst? In other words, could instead of PD, and instead of it going off as it's hitting the ground, did they have air burst capability because we had that? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, uh, we've had three different variations of air burst. One of them, I actually wrote the original requirement specification for it, the FB 160, which bursted the HE projectile, uh, we call high, high fragmentation round at uh, 15 feet AGL. Uh, the earlier versions here, the M732 and M732A2, did the same thing, but they had a, uh, a, a 20, 25 meter burst height, which was too high for us. Can you talk to the current mission of the C-130s? Uh, just in basic terms, uh, I promised the public affairs people that would dig too far into that. Uh, <coughs> I can talk about the things that are on the internet or you know that are released. Uh, how many we have? We have 30 right now that are that are inventory. They're all brand new AC-130Js uh, with the Rolls Royce engines. They are armed with uh, 30 a 30 millimeter gun we just talked about, a 105 still, and a small diameter bomb. We can also drop small diameter bomb, fire Hellfire missiles and two other small PGMs we call the Small Glide Mission and the Griffin Missile. So it's more of a, uh, in what we talk about is a golf bag of capabilities. One club is not going to do it for shooting around golf, but you need a, a bag of capabilities. Pretty much the same way with the AC-130, so it's a tailored response. We're not just cold-blooded killers going out there and wiping out everything. Our job is to protect our friendly forces now. Uh, it's much different than when the gunship first came up. It was pretty much interdiction. Stop these trucks, destroy these trucks. Our mission now is not interdiction. Our mission is support our ground force. This includes anybody in USOCOM, uh, including the Army, the Ranger, the Rangers, uh, and all the special mission elements or special mission units. That's who we support, and it's always, uh, how can I say this politely, judicious use of force. So if we see a ground party, we see a threat to the ground party, if they're not yet in range, we'll go bang down a couple of rounds in between them and get them to change their mind. Maybe they don't need to go over there. Sometimes it's a direct engagement. It all depends on on what the mission is and what the threat to the friendlies are. That's what our job is, to be their fire support. That's, that's what we do now. Ma'am? Do we have a one that went over the ground to Okay, the, the question was, uh, do we have any, wet, or any gunships in Ukraine? Can't answer that, but I can say there are gunships that are not at home right now. <laughs> That's about as deep as I can get. <clears throat> we have people on the road all the time. In my uh, my time in, uh, as a crewman on the AC-130, I was involved in the, the Iran mission, 1980. A lot of people don't know that we were part of that. We had four airplanes, uh, Grenada. Panama, El Salvador, we were in El Salvador for seven years, and people say, really? You guys were in El Salvador? Yeah, we flew that mission for seven continuous years. We did Operation Just Cause in Panama, when we basically evicted Noriega, and uh, when we were involved in that mission for three years prior to Just Cause. So people see the stuff that happens, it's released on the news. There's a lot more things that happen in the background prior to. We did uh, go to Desert Shield and Storm, and also uh, Somalia. We were supposed to be there with Task Force Ranger. We actually trained up with them prior to the deployment, and we were pulled off by 
I'll be polite. Political general officers that pulled us off and said, no, we don't want to escalate the situation. So they sent them forward without us. My crew was working in, uh, in Bosnia at the time, and we got diverted from Bosnia down to Somalia on the 7th of October. Bloody Sunday was on the 3rd. Day late, dollar short. I mean, we should have been there, but we weren't. And, but that's the back story on that. All right, uh, back on uh, one thing I want to cover. The mission in Vietnam, 10,000 trucks destroyed that they know for sure. It was actually North Vietnamese said they thought it was more like 11,000 in their records. What's the diff? This is, this is how effective this small. There's only 28 AC-130s ever made. We lost six of them in combat operations. But yet, they still were 90, over 90% 90 of the trucks killed in Vietnam were shot by this small contingent of AC-130 gunships. And now, I won't say they were the only ones there. We had Navy there, flying A-6s. We had uh, Army, we had Air Force. We had everybody that was going after these trucks on what was called Operation Commando Hunt and all the phases of the Commando Hunt. But the gunship came out uh, is the number one. Now, we're talking about the gunship losses in Vietnam. All that success comes with a price. And we can see the very first one I talked about earlier, Carter, aircraft 629, crashed on the runway at Uman after losing all their hydraulics and flew it. The pilot actually flew it all back. He's since passed away, but I had a pretty interesting interview with him. He's, he's there. Lost all hydraulics, his preliminary operator with the eye on the back. He winds up dying from 37 millimeter fragments. He's on the airplane, he's bleeding out, and they're trying to save his life. They're trying to fly the airplane back, had no hydraulics, no hydraulics, no flight controls. So he, he and the co-pilot are wrestling with flight controls, and they got the airplane trimmed out, because it's the only thing they had was trim, electric trim. But yet, whenever he put in power, it started climbing. So you have to back it down. He's just between, just very close to stall speed. So he says, okay, everybody in the back that's not taken care of, the I.O. come up front. And they all went up to the front of the airplane, and all that human body weight on there was enough to where it keep the nose down, he put power in. Flew it all the way back from Laos, back to Ubon, Thailand, and tried to land it with no hydraulics. And he wound up crashing on the runway. Uh, most of the crew had bailed out prior to that, just prior to the landing. And, uh, but yet the flight engineer was killed on, on, the, on the crash. Uh, and uh, like I say, Bill Schwinn was his name, and he has since passed away. Very interesting story, an amazing feat of airmanship, if you ask me to think of all this old school flying. They should have never made it back. Had they not been good pilots, and all the pilots in the original AC-130 or AC days, you had to have a thousand hours on the airplane already, on a slick 130, or you want to get in there. In this particular case, it paid off, because he had a lot more than a thousand hours. Uh, 625 ad lib was hit, uh, 37 millimeter, uh, one survivor, uh, we think it was smoke inhalation. Flare launcher caught on fire. They're driving forward, and the gunner in the back, Gene Fields, is the only survivor. He said he passed out. There's so much smoke. And he came to, and he unplugged his Concorde, and he's trying to talk, and nobody answered. He thought, well, they must have bailed out. So he puts on his parachute, and off he goes. He's the only survivor. The airplane just kept on right into the side of the mountain. That was it. We never figured out what happened because they didn't have uh, flight data recorders on back then. Uh, March 72, Spectre 1-3, that's the one I was talking about with the SA-2. SA-2 ambush. One SA-2, 35-foot 30, uh, long missile, hit that airplane directly in the right, right side of the fuselage and wing. Everybody was lost in that one, all 14. Uh, March 72, uh, Spectre 22, the very next night, which is really intriguing to me. Like, you lose an airplane with 14 guys, 
you say, well, okay, let's stand down for a while and figure out what happened. Nope, they didn't. They flew just like they did. And I'm sure there's people in this room, Vietnam era veterans, you know, you know what it's about. It's all about the mission, get her done. They flew it the very next night in an area further north, up in the, up in the, uh, the Plain of Jars, in that area, in Barrel Roll. And they took a 57 millimeter hit in the wing. Wings on fire, control bailout. And they bailed out after they got over Steel Tiger West, bailed out the whole crew. And that guy, he lives up in North Carolina, he's a hoot. And then uh, June 72, Spectre 1 1 uh, had uh, two survivors on that one. That was, uh, one of them was a good friend of mine who passed away two years ago, just, uh, just before the anniversary of his 50th anniversary of the aircraft loss. That's one where they were hit with a missile in the right wing. The right wing broke off. He managed to get his chute on upside down and backwards and bailed out with only one riser connected and managed to survive. Amazing. Uh, he was a sport diver, and I think that's what really helped him out. The other two survivors were in the booth. When the wing broke off and the airplane just started doing this, they were pinned in place by G-Force and I got both of their survivor witness statements. And uh, they, again, probably shouldn't have made it out, but they did. One of them says, I was standing by the ammo rack and I was pinned in place. The weight came off and I was just pinned in place by some trivial force. I couldn't do anything. All I saw was gunner's bodies pasted to the fuselage. They were scared. No kidding, I would be too. And the other one says, I made it as far as the booth, the capsule inside the airplane where the IR was. And he says, and there was a fire control officer by that time, he says, I made it there and it pushed me down in the seat and all I could see was the attitude indicator spinning. He says, I knew I was gonna die. There's nothing I could do about it. I just couldn't move. And both of them said, all of a sudden I heard this loud bang and it got dark and I felt like I was falling. So I pulled my parachute, and the parachute inflated, and I saw the airplane hit the, hit the ground. What happened was the tail of the airplane broke off and spit them out. So they are so very lucky in that particular, and they're both still around yet. One of them lives in, uh, in Texas, and the other one, I think he's in North Carolina. And, but the third one, Bill Patterson, my, my buddy, he passed away two years ago, like I said. And uh, Spectre 1-7. That was the very last loss of the Vietnam War. They were over Laos, and they got hit by 37 millimeter in the left wing. And they were flying back. It was not a fatal hit. It just punched a hole in the wing, and there was fuel dripping down the wing route and into the car compartment, and just dripping and running down the back of the airplane. So they're trying to get it back, and one of, uh, one of the survivors, uh, Willie, Willie, uh, one of the gunners that came, saw me here about a year ago, says, uh, yeah, we're there, standing on the edge of the ramp just like this, 6,000 feet straight down, standing on the end of the ramp. He says, the wing broke off and I couldn't get out of the airplane. I was trying to jump because he was falling at the same rate as the airplane. And he says he finally managed to get away, and the I.O. managed to get away, but nobody else made it out. And the airplane crashed, and we lost uh, uh, 14 on that one. So, of total, six aircraft lost during the Vietnam conflict. Uh, all of them in Laos, with the exception of Spectre 107, was right on the border of uh, Laos and Vietnam. And 52 crewmen, uh, I would say they're brave, facing all the uh, the AAA, and the, these guys just kept on doing it. It's like, I, I'm not aware of anybody throwing in a towel, although there was a few of them that told me later on, they said they wish they would have, but they didn't want to let their buddies down, so they stuck with it. One of them, after uh, this, let me go back to this picture right here. This is a hole in the bottom of the fuselage that was blown in there with 57 millimeter, hit the bottom of the airplane, and the, the, the IR operator was sitting in a seat right above, you can't see in that picture where the seat broke off, 
This is 509, aircraft 509. If anybody goes up on the internet and search Spectre 17, Spectre 17, we made a video of all these guys talking about this ordeal. Blew a hole in the bottom of the airplane, he fell in the hole. And he said, there's this bright, brilliant flash, and all of a sudden, I didn't know what was going on. I'm looking, and I'm seeing people's feet right here. He says, something ain't right about this. And uh, he was really messed up. His legs got messed up. But he almost fell out of the airplane. Now, luckily, he didn't. But uh, Gary Chandler is his name. Heck, he retired as a colonel. He actually came back as a captain at the time. Blew a hole in the airplane. His buddies pulled him out of the hole. Another one took a piece of shrapnel in the neck, and he survived. Uh, but the pilot, uh, who's also a good friend of mine, he flew it back, and he says, look, this is my job to bring my crew back, and he did. And he didn't want to know how badly damaged the airplane was. All he wanted to know was, is it flyable? And he landed it, and he greased it in, no problem. And then they got, they got uh, uh, Gary loaded up in the ambulance and had to take him down to Saigon for emergency surgery to save his feet. And he's walking around just fine, just saw him a couple years ago. So it's an amazing story about how those guys, Spectre 1-7, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. It's really great. And then one of the guys in there, you'll see, uh, he, he said, you know, I, I didn't really want to go again, but I felt like I had to. He wound up flying, flying another 40 missions after that. Typical mission length, we had some guys, usually around 100 in a one year span, but we've had guys that were banging on the door 300 missions. That takes a lot of courage, if you ask me. Sir. <laughs> Great question. We had talked about that earlier. His, his question was, have any of our adversaries came up with a similar concept? And the answer is yes, uh, with our help. Now, I could say the first concept was actually by the French in World War II. It never really went anywhere. But it was the same concept. Again, they did some sub-hunting with the same concept. It didn't really become a, a viable option until Vietnam with AC-47 and AC-130. In, in the 1980s, we actually developed an AC-47 for the El Salvadoran Air Force. They were not armed with mini guns. They had M250 cows on, three of them in the window. Very much the same as that. Uh, they no longer fly that airplane, but Columbia, we also did one for them. It's called the Elf uh, Phantasma, the Ghost, and they're still flying it. And but now it's the Basil turbos on the on the DC threes. They modified DC threes in the Basil turbo. They're still running it. We came up with a concept of small AC twenty seven, which is called Gunship Light. It was based on the Alenia C-27 cargo airplane, which looks like a smaller C-130, but it's actually not. Uh, and that's a program that I worked for a while, and it was going somewhere until the Army pulled the funding. And we were relying on them for the formal school and everything, so that project kind of died on the line. Uh, ATK, the, uh, the vendor uh, company, tried to, to sell it to other countries, but uh, it didn't really take off. So, thank you. One more, sir. One more question. The, arm, uh, the uh, Navy and the Air Force has what they call a wild reason, which flies in front of all the fighters going in to hit certain spots. And if radar is locked onto the planes, they send a missile right down into that uh, uh, center that's trying to uh, spot our people to knock it out. Did the scene, did, did, did the gunship have any way to protect itself from the radar off? Yes, uh, that's a really good question because I, I have two phases of that. I hope I'm not running overtime if anybody's bored. Uh, so the first question with the, uh, the, the wild weasels, yes, on the night we lost Spectre 1-3, uh, there was a wild weasel in in. The target area, about 23 nautical miles away, plus the North Vietnamese had learned that 
when the gunship, and we did have electronic warfare officers, we did have jamming pods on, but they're only effective to a certain extent. Uh, so what they have done is they learned, leave the radar off until you know you're ready to fire. And so they had two radars on an SA-7 and a fan song radar system. So actually three technically, but the two firing radars, they would lock up and they laid that radar looking right through where they knew the gunships were coming through. It was a natural terrain feature they call the trail entrance. It was basically between two high terrain areas. So they knew, they set up this missile site to ambush the gunship intentionally, saying, we know they're coming through here, they're not gonna expect it. It's 23 miles into Laos. So they set up that site. The very first thing they did was they turned on the radars right away when they all saw the airplane approaching, and they waited until the airplane went past them to fire. SA-2 is not good at tail chase. So the airplane already had the opportunity to evade and jam and descend at that time. One of those guys on the first mission lives right down the street from me in Fort Walton, Woody. And uh, so he was talking about, yeah, it seemed like a big car headlight coming at us and we didn't know what was going on. That was the first SA-2. They launched the second one the same way. By the third one, they said, all right, we'll leave our radars off. We're going to lay radar one, looking right in the gap. And we're going to, as soon as they're within range, when they got in the P-12 radar, says, okay, they're in range, 11 kilometers, if I remember right. They spool up that radar one, and a few seconds later, radar two locked on an airplane and launched within six seconds. So the airplane was stuck in this gap. Couldn't break right because the train couldn't break left, couldn't descend, it was just there. And they launched two missiles and one of them struck directly. So ECM, electronic countermeasure, is only good to a certain extent, and it depends on where you're at. In that particular case, they shot them right in the face. So it was not, uh, not effective. All right, uh, any other, sir? Did you have any other countermeasures? Shaft suspensors? Yes, uh, now depending on when, uh, we used to have these chaff bundles were just little cardboard boxes that would break open in the slipstream. That was the very first one that the radar threats came up in 72. And they were still in effect when I started in 78. And man, I tell you, you don't want to break one of those open in an airplane because it's just aluminum foil was a little everywhere. But uh, yeah, they had that and uh, eventually they have put chaff inside the Lao 74 launcher that would pump out chaff and pump out flares. So both of these were decoys, the flares obviously for IR missiles, the chaff for the radar missiles. But uh, a good SA-2 operator could differentiate that as well, especially when you're already narrowed down, because the way the SA-2 works is like, it's always going back and forth like this. Like they say, rattlesnake audio, you guys in the aviation business know rattlesnake audio. SA-2, when it's tracking you, you hear, Beep, beep, beep. That means it's only looking for you. When the beeps get closer together, like beep, 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 when it sounds like a rattlesnake, they're getting ready to launch. And there was, on our airplanes at that time, tracking indications and launch indications. As a matter of fact, the very first AC-130 to be fired on with an SA-2 was down near Chapone, Laos, on the riverbank, and that was 1970. And I have that, a good description of that in the book. Was, uh, the crew, they, they get locked on, and actually I know that the, the EWO, the Electronic Warfare Officer's son, the, the gentleman has passed on, but you know, he was really excited to hear about this. Uh, Ballsmith was his name. And he says, yeah, rattlesnake audio? Okay, I got, I got sand launch. Oh my God, sand activities first. I got sand launch. Oh my God, and it comes off and it just lights up the whole jungle. And the fortunate part for them was they had actually did a split S with a C-130. And they were in an area down by the river. It was actually not a whole lot of terrain right there. So they managed to escape it. And they said, and Dick Kaufman, who was the NAV, who 
used to live right down the road from me, has since passed too. He says, yeah, it was pretty wild. We were there. We, we survived it. And then the pilot says, do you think they got another one of those? I think that's probably not. So they all made a crew decision to go back in there and shoot these trucks, which we found out later, those trucks were probably just a decoy because they would do that too. They'd set up these trucks, they'd take like charcoal briquettes and stuff and put them in the engine block, these, so these shot up trucks, they'd make a convoy that looked way too good. And they were going after that, and that's what they figured out later on, is like, this convoy is not really a real convoy, they were trying to bait us in to shoot at us, and they did. They went back in a second time, and guess what? They got shot at all over again and survived that one. Says, now the pilot says, and his name is Ed Holly, he says, I think it's time to go home. <laughs> yes, it was. And that, that's, uh, that's on the internet as far as one of the aviation historical magazines called uh, Dodging Sands and AC-130. It's an interesting read, too. So. All right, anybody else? All right, well, I thank you all for uh, for your patience. I think I ran over a little bit, but... Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Nelson, for coming on today. If you're interested in learning more, we have his books up front, and they're also sold on Amazon. If a few uh, short announcements, on March 7th, uh, Tim Trout and Jeff Lyons are going to be speaking on the history of Marcia Jaggi. Marcia. Marcia Yaki. <laughs> Marcia. If you're interested in speaking with Jennifer Browning, on March 23rd, EAA Chapter 21 Young Eagles Day, free flights for review 8 through 17. You can register at youngeaglesday.org. It is also, we have flyers at the front desk. And also on April 28th, or April 8th, or we are having our Eclipse event here at the museum. We open at 10 a.m. We have a parking fee of $20. We have a regular admission of $11 for adults, and then active military children is $8. And beds from World War II and three events are free. Our grill opens at 11, and we're also having a live band. You can go to be sure to get ready for that. And that is it for my announcements, and thank you for coming out.